We all have around 20,000 genes encoded in our genome. Some of these genes are important for metabolism, others for transporting oxygen around our bodies, and others that control our hair growth. But are there any genes for longevity? Well, to cut a very interesting story short, no, there are no such things as longevity genes. But the story does not end there. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video I've prepared an interesting tale of exploration into this question from understanding why there is no such thing as longevity genes, to discussing the heritability of longevity, and why it's rather possible that you will have genetic variants that will have some impact over your longevity. And finally, we'll look at how much of ageing is genetic. So an obvious beginning is with good old muzzle organisms, whereby genetic changes cause great perturbations in their lifespan. Pioneering work in this field comes from Cynthia Kenyon, who discovered genetic mutations in worms that dramatically extended their lifespan. Specific mutations in these worms enabled them to live up to 10 times longer, and conserved mutations of these worm genes in other model organisms also extended their lifespan, with extensions of up to 50% in mice and flies. Now, there are two interesting points about these studies. The first is, well, what are these genes doing? And secondly, a conversation about monogenic versus polygenic traits. So firstly, the genetic mutations. What genes are they in and what do those genes do? Well, the mutation discovered in the Kenyon lab back in 1993 that doubled the lifespan of worms was in a gene known as DAF2. Now, DAF2 encodes a protein that is a regulator of the insulin IGF2 response. So, for example, signalling following high sugar levels. Typically, this signalling pathway promotes growth. However, the presence of this mutation reduced signalling through this pathway, and instead of growth, the current consensus is that there is a switch to more protective mechanisms, such as expression of antioxidant genes or stress response genes. And other genetic mutations in different components of these pathways, or similar pathways, such as mTOR and AMPK, have also been shown to influence lifespan in muscle organisms. Now, collectively, these different proteins and their signalling pathways are referred to as the longevity signalling pathways, but that doesn't mean they are genes for longevity. The genes have really important functions within cells, it's just that their aberrant activity of these factors seem to be influencing the ageing process and therefore perturbing it seems to have some longevity benefits. But it would be incorrect to call the gene a longevity gene. But importantly, these different signalling pathways are conserved from yeast through to us humans, which is why lifespan extension was also seen in the flies and mice, not just the worms. Now, you might be thinking, if these mutations are conserved from worms to mice, then what about humans? Well, I would say, what a great question. And remember that second point I said we'd come back to, a conversation about monogenic versus polygenic traits. Well, now we're coming back to it. So the studies I discussed above refer to lifespan extensions after just a single mutation. And when a trait comes from just one mutation, such as the case of lifespan here, it is often referred to as monogenic. Now, more commonly, this is referred to in the context of disease. For example, sickle cell anemia is due to a single mutation, hence it's a monogenic disease. And so the opposite is the case with polygenic conditions. Then, in polygenic cases, multiple genetic variations are involved within a trait. So what about ageing? Well, similarly to the model organisms studies above, Monogenic changes have been seen in human patients that can strongly promote health or reduce longevity. For example, patients with Larin syndrome have a mutation in the growth hormone receptor, which is all part of the same pathways we saw earlier. And this mutation reduced signaling. So whilst their growth suffers as a result of this mutation, patients with Larin syndrome have short stature, but due to their reduced signaling, they also show a reduced risk of age-associated diseases such as type 2 diabetes and cancer. Conversely, other monogenic mutations in humans advance ageing, for example in progeria patients. Despite these cases of a single mutation having quite a strong phenotype, 
Longevity, or lifespan, is a complex trait that is affected by multiple factors. Now, quite often I talk about the non-genetic factors, such as diet, physical activity, health habits, and psychosocial factors, as they can be interesting to think about in terms of translational implementation into our own lives, but there is still a genetic component. But this genetic component does not just refer to one gene out of the 20,000 genes we have on our genomes, and they're not necessarily even restricted to regions of genes. But that's a story for another day. But the point is that we all have different genetic variations that affect how our bodies function, and therefore could be implicating our own longevity. An interesting observation that has been seen so far in genetic studies of ageing in humans is that at least at increasingly older ages, so living beyond 100 years, the genetic component becomes exceedingly strong, so that ratio of non-genetic to genetic factors seems to be stronger in centenarians. But which genetic variations in humans have been linked with lifespan? Well, one way to examine this is through so-called genome-wide association studies, I explain this in another video, but simply here, it's a way of comparing the genetics of people with a very similar, if not the same characteristic, to people without the traits, and to see whether there is a correlation between the presence or absence of this trait and genetic variations. So in the case of lifespan, the phenotype is lifespan, and then they look at what genetic variations are associated with having a longer lifespan. The catch is, this isn't quite as simple as I've just described, as the results have been a bit underwhelming, which may be correct that the genetic component of ageing is underwhelming compared to the non-genetic influences, but anyway, some interesting results have come from these studies. In fact, more than 50 different genetic loci have been identified. However, only a few of these have been repeatedly seen in multiple studies. One of these is in the gene APOE, which encodes a protein that has been linked with Alzheimer's disease, and another is in the gene FOXO3. Interestingly, the worm equivalent of FOXO3 has been associated with longevity in the organism. Now, these different genetic variations have a small effect size when it comes to genetics of lifespan. In other words, the smaller section of variation that contributes to genetics in whole accounting for heritability well, just part of that can be explained by these variants. There is also missing heritability for human longevity. So what could this be and why should we care? Well, firstly, it's cool. But more seriously, identifying variants or genes associated with longevity. If you then find out what those genes do, it may help to understand the biological underpinnings that contribute to ageing. And the good news for us is that the ability to do all these sequencing technologies gets cheaper each year, and so there's an increasingly number of studies investigating this. For example, this brings me onto a recent study that has identified some rare genetic coding variants in a cohort of 515 Ashkenazi Jewish centenarians. By having a cohort of similar descendants, it helps to homogenise the genetic background making it hopefully easier to detect any causal variants linked to longevity. Anyway, what did they see? Well, they sort of further confirmed what is seen in model organisms, such that there was a longevity association of rare variants in the insulin and AMPK signalling pathways, although not in the mTOR pathway this time. But interestingly, they also found pathways linked to human ageing that have not yet been identified in model organisms, such as protective effects of rare variants in the Wnt signalling pathway on human lifespan. Interestingly, the Wnt signalling pathway is often spoken about in terms of stem cells, and so maybe that's where a link could be associated between the Wnt signalling and ageing. But these genetic studies, whilst they're very informative, they don't actually provide any knowledge about the molecular impact of these genetic variants. For example, how exactly is wind signalling altered in these centenarians? Is it enhanced or repressed? But nonetheless, the study confirms the role that genetics can play in the ageing process. But hang on a minute, there is still a really important point to discuss. Just how much of ageing can be accounted for by genetics? Or in fancier words, how heritable is longevity? Well, heritability is the ratio of the genetic component to the sum of the genetic and environmental factors. 
Now, there is no right or wrong answer to the heritability of human lifespan, simply because heritability seems to be specific to a population and the environmental exposure current in that population. But anyway, so far, estimates range from around 20 to 30% from twin studies to 48% and 33% in men and women, respectively, if it's a family with a centenarian. But it's also thought that these may be overestimates, with heritability of longevity being closer to 16% or even below 10%. So, all in all, there is evidently a genetic component to longevity, and identifying further pathways with genetics linked to ageing and or age-related diseases offers insight into novel pathways that could be intervened pharmacologically, which is a good thing. So, with that, I hope you've enjoyed this video on the genetics of ageing, Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.